By the early 1930s, the United States was in the grip of both natural and man-made disasters, which were overturning the lives of millions of people. Dust Bowl and Slump were forcing whole communities to uproot themselves and head west to find a new life. Prohibition and poverty unleashed a new wave of lawlessness. The stories of the outlaws and gangsters of those years have been told and retold in hundreds of films and books. Today, they still exercise a powerful grip on the imagination, despite the brutality and violence of what really happened. Another great American legend to rival the Western had been born. On the 16th of January, 1935, FBI agents surrounded a house in a remote rural area of Florida. A gun battle broke out after warnings had been shouted. Tear gas shells were fired, and after 45 minutes, agents broke in to find the inhabitants dead. They had killed two of America's most wanted criminals, Kate Ma Barker and Fred, one of her four sons. For more than 20 years, the Barker boys, urged on by their mother, had been one of the United States' most successful criminal gangs. They had robbed scores of banks, got away with hundreds of thousands of dollars, and killed dozens of people. Ma Barker had been born Arizona Donnie Clark in Missouri in 1872. Her father was a hard-drinking, illiterate ranch hand, and her mother a devout Christian who disciplined her daughter strictly. Harry, as Ma Barker then called herself, reacted against this upbringing by developing a hatred of any sort of authority. She became obsessed with the exploits of outlaws such as Jesse James and the Dalton Gang, who were carving themselves a bloody part in the legend of the West while she was a girl. In 1892, Harry was inconsolable when the Dalton Gang was shot down in their final vicious bank raid. Also in 1892, Harry married a weak, ineffectual alcoholic named George Barker. They had four sons, Herman, born in 1894, Lloyd in 1896, Arthur in 1899, and Fred in 1902. Constantly in grinding poverty, Ma Barker turned to crime and brought up her sons to be the core of her gang. They mixed with hardened criminals who Ma Barker sheltered when they emerged from prison and were taught to admire them and imitate their exploits. By the time they'd reached adolescence, the Barker boys habitually carried guns and were taking part in increasingly serious crimes. By 1922, the two younger sons, Arthur and Fred, were serving long sentences, while their elder brother Lloyd had been sent to Leavenworth for 25 years for wounding a guard during a raid on a post office. Then, in 1927, Herman, the only son who remained free, was cornered after a robbery and killed himself following a shootout with the police. For the next four years, Ma Barker lived without her sons. She took up with a dapper but penniless bill poster named Arthur Douglas, sheltered other criminals, is said to have planned robberies for them, and wrote endless petitions to try to get her remaining sons released. Finally, in 1931, her pleas to have one of my poor babies freed paid off, and Fred was let out of prison. Extraordinarily, his soulmate and lover, a professional bank robber, Alvin Carpis, also managed to wangle his way out of prison at the same time. It was the heyday of crime in the United States, with major gangs and gangland leaders now dominating the great cities and starting to link up to form what were in effect national crime syndicates. The defining event, which had begun the change from local gangs run mainly by Italian, Irish or East European immigrants, had been the introduction of prohibition in 1919. 
Now there was a truly national demand for a product which most people regarded as barely illegal. Sophisticated distribution networks soon grew up as local bosses moved on from protection rackets, gambling or prostitution to satisfy this massive new market. Liquor was brought in by boat from the Caribbean or smuggled across the long border with Canada. The customs and federal authorities struck back as best they could. Shipments were confiscated and taken away to be destroyed. Illicit stills were tracked down and broken up. Ever more sophisticated and violent methods of tracking down booze smugglers were employed and given widespread publicity by the authorities. But still the drink kept getting through. Gangland wars in cities such as Chicago or New York became frequent. And local bosses like Al Capone in Chicago became nationally known for their wealth and feared for their ruthlessness. Politicians such as New York's mayor Jimmy Walker condoned and indulged in massive bribery of the police and judicial system, thus helping to create a dangerous and widespread public contempt for the law. This was typified by the way in which speakeasy hostesses, like Texas Guy Nan, became media celebrities. By the end of the 1920s, the general feeling of anything goes and get rich quick was reflected in the giddy rise of the New York stock market. Then came the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. Almost overnight, there was a spiraling collapse of the American and then the world economies. Millions were made unemployed and forced to beg on the streets. The federal and state governments seemed helpless, and many desperate people began to turn to crime. Soon, in many parts of the country, gangs of outlaws and bank robbers were building up semi-romantic legends. Typical were Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, who cut a swathe across Texas and other southern states, robbing banks and killing lawmen for several months in 1933 and 34. The murderous couple were ambushed and killed in May 1934, as shown in this reconstruction made a few hours after the shooting and using the Texas Rangers who carried it out. In reality, Bonnie and Clyde were cold-blooded killers with nothing romantic about them. They were also pretty ineffective at their chosen job. The most they ever managed to steal in any one raid was two and a half thousand dollars. And one of the other legendary robbers of the period, John Dillinger, was driven to complain, pair of punks, they're giving bank robbing a bad name. Dillinger himself justified his legend somewhat more. In an amazingly short career, 11 months from September 1933 to July 1934, he achieved national fame and became the FBI's public enemy number one. He planned many of his raids with care and was known on occasions to allow waiting customers to keep their money, saying that he only wanted to steal from the banks.
legend was further embellished in March 1934, when, having been captured while resting in Tucson, Arizona, Dillinger was brought by air and under massive guard to the supposedly escape-proof jail at Crown Point, Indiana. There, Dillinger posed with the woman governor and other warders before escaping. A gun had been smuggled into him, but to hide the identity of his helper, he later claimed to have carved this replica out of a piece of wood. Dillinger barely escaped being recaptured a few weeks later when the FBI surrounded his gang at the Little Bohemia Lodge a closed summer resort hotel about 50 miles from Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Dillinger took cover in the anonymity of Chicago and underwent facial surgery to change his appearance. But on the 22nd of July, 1934, the FBI were tipped off that he was going to the movies. As he came out after the show, he was gunned down in the street. Onlookers pointed out the spot where he fell. And the FBI proudly displayed the body of one of its top public enemies. But for J. Edgar Hoover, the agency's publicity hungry boss and founder, there were plenty more to be put on the wanted posters and tracked down. And by the time that John Dillinger had been disposed of, Ma Barker, her son Fred, and his lover Alvin Carpis had moved into the top spot. Following their release in March 1931, Carpis, who Ma treated as another son, and Fred had become the focus of a gang which set off on a crime spree across the Middle West. Twice they were captured, but managed to escape from small town jails. Always they returned to Ma Barker, who manned their crime headquarters in a remote farmhouse in Missouri. Precisely what role Ma Barker played has long been debated. She is said to have undertaken much of the planning, reconnoitering the targets and insisting on careful rehearsals. Certainly her boys were successful. During the two-year period between 1931 and 33, they hit dozens of banks, getting away with more than half a million dollars and murdering dozens of people. More than anyone else, they justify the substantial rewards being offered by the banks. Extraordinarily, in the middle of this spree in October 1932, Arthur Doc Barker was paroled. Now his mother had two sons with whom to work. In the spring of 1933, a Chicago gangster named Fred Gertz suggested to the Barkers that another type of crime might be less risky and even more profitable, kidnapping. Their first target was William Ham, the wealthy head of a major St. Paul brewing company. On the 15th of June, 1933, as he was walking home from his brewery, Ham was bundled into a car, blindfolded, and driven for several hours to a hideout. The next day, his family received a ransom demand of $100,000, with the threat that if they involved the police, William Ham would never get home again. Nevertheless, the police were told, but on the 17th, the ransom was thrown out beside a road as instructed. The following day, William Ham was dumped blindfolded near this remote farmhouse in Minneapolis. The family called the police, and Ham's safe recovery became a national sensation. When he got home, Ham also appeared before crowds of reporters. He was asked what his kidnappers had said before he was released, and replied, they said that if ever I wanted anything, or if they can ever do anything for me, just to let them know. A Chicago gang run by Roger the Terrible Tuey were later rounded up and mistakenly charged with the kidnapping of William Ham. No one in the Barker Carpis gang bothered to inform the authorities otherwise, but Tuey was found not guilty. The Barkers were too busy planning and executing other crimes, including another kidnapping of the wealthy St. Paul's Bank president, Edward George Bramer. On 
the 17th of January, 1934, Bremer set off for work, taking his eight-year-old daughter with him, as usual, to be dropped off at school. As he slowed down for a turning, Bremer's car was stopped, and as this contemporary reconstruction shows, an armed man got in and pushed him out of the driving seat. As Bremer was driven to a hideout, he was forced to sign a ransom demand for $200,000. His family did not go to the police, and as instructed, soon put an advertisement in the paper agreeing to pay. But there were delays in handing over the ransom, and the psychopathic Fred Barker came close to killing Bremer. He was only stopped when Arthur warned him not to annoy their mother by wasting a very valuable asset. Finally, after three weeks, a bank employee set off with two bags containing the $200,000. These were left at a pre-arranged spot near Farmington, Illinois. And then on the 7th of February, 1934, Arthur Bremer was dumped blindfolded on a lonely road near Rochester in Minnesota. His release also caused a sensation and Bremer was able to give both reporters and the police many details, both of his captors and the way in which he was abducted. As the car stopped, the right-hand door opened and an arm was thrust in the door with a gun saying, don't move or I'll kill you. So I turned to open the left-hand door and by the time I turned, the party must have been in the car and was hitting me over the head with some object. Uh, I put my leg out of the car hoping that I could keep it out long enough to keep them there and attract attention, but by that time, uh, blood covered my eyes and they put my head under the dashboard. The gang had become careless and the released banker was able to recognize several of them from police photographs. Ma, her two boys and Alvin Carpis fled to Chicago where they unsuccessfully tried to change their appearances using plastic surgery. They then split up and Ma and Fred headed for Florida. But when the FBI was tipped off and arrested Arthur, they found a map giving the location of his mother's hideout. So on the 16th of January, 1935, FBI agents closed in on the house near Oklahoma. Ma Barker and Fred fought savagely for 45 minutes before being shot dead. Their bodies were put on display for the waiting press. The Barkers were not the only criminals to have spotted kidnapping as a lucrative opportunity. On the 22nd of July, 1933, just after they had lifted William Hamm, a millionaire Oklahoma oil man named Charles Urschel was seized at his home. Urschel's friend, William Jarrett, who had been taken at the same time, was dumped by the side of the road. A $200,000 ransom was demanded and Charles Urschel was soon released. Information that he and Jarrett gave the police swiftly enabled them to locate his abductor's hideout, the Shannon Ranch in northern Texas, and some of the ransom money was found hidden. Everyone arrested at the Shannon Ranch was taken for trial, but most were able to plead ignorance and claim that the kidnapping had been carried out by the infamous George Machine Gun Kelly and his beautiful but deadly wife, Catherine, who had disappeared soon after Urschel's release. Catherine's mother, who had married the rancher Boss Shannon, and undoubtedly used the ranch as a safe haven for her criminal daughter was among those found guilty. The jury gave her and a few others light sentences for harboring criminals. As the Shannon gang were taken away, Urschel's kidnappers remained at large. 
that Kelly and his wife were arrested in Memphis, Tennessee on the 26th of September, 1933. And the gunman, with a fearsome reputation and nickname, was brought for trial. The jury heard how Kelly had begun his career as a small-time booze smuggler in Memphis. He had been spotted by Catherine as a likely potential partner, both in marriage and crime. It was her publicity skill which had got Kelly his reputation as a ruthless expert with the recently developed Thompson submachine gun. And it was Catherine who had masterminded their robberies and fatefully decided that they should move from prank robbery to kidnapping. Without her, Kelly would have remained a minor bootlegger. Judge and jury recognized who was the real power in this criminal partnership when Catherine was treated as severely as Kelly for the Urshel kidnapping. Both were found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. After signing for belongings which had been taken from her at the beginning of the trial, Catherine was taken away to a Cincinnati workhouse for women, where she remained until paroled in 1958. Machine Gun Kelly was treated with the respect his nickname deserved and flown under heavy guard to the new high-security prison of Alcatraz. But it emerged that Kelly did not deserve his reputation, big and boastful, but a total coward and hopeless drunk. He hated violence and the sound of gunfire and had kept well away from many of the robberies with which he had been credited. On Alcatraz, Kelly was to prove a model prisoner giving no problems and seeming to adapt totally to the routine. He stayed there until 1954, when he was moved to Leavenworth, where he died shortly afterwards. One of Kelly's fellow prisoners was Arthur Doc Barker, who had also received a life sentence for kidnapping. And Barker was soon joined on the rock by Alvin Carpis, who had been arrested in 1936. Carpis was to become the longest serving prisoner on Alcatraz spending some 26 years there before being released on parole in 1962. Surrounded by the swirling, treacherous waters of San Francisco Bay, the rock was widely believed to be escape-proof. But Arthur Barker was one of the many prisoners who decided to put this to the test. In June 1939, with four other prisoners, he managed to get out of his cell. But Barker was shot down by guards and his companions captured as they scrambled to reach the water's edge. The press celebrated the death of yet another public enemy. Ironically, even Lloyd, Ma Barker's only surviving son who had missed all the action while serving his 25-year sentence, died violently, shot by his wife shortly after his release in 1947. His violent death was a fitting end for the Barker boys and their legendary Ma had lived by the gun and not been afraid to die by it. Their brutal lives and those of the other gangsters who achieved legendary status are the reality of an era of crime which has been in danger of being idealized by countless subsequent books and films. The bullets and bombs were real, and the deaths and injuries they caused were horrific.